Fabrice Grunda is a great uh, entrepreneur. He's been uh, creating a uh, number of successes and he prepared a talk um, on the future. So we're going to uh, hear from him and, uh, and then voilà. get the judges back on stage. Fabrice, welcome. <laughs> Thank you. So we live in difficult times. Global warming, Syrian conflict, Euro Eurozone crisis, financial crisis. We are constantly being bombarded by negative news and despairing news. In fact, in Europe today, you know, the mood is morose and the prospects seem dire. The general consensus is that things are bad. The only real conversation is around how bad are things going to get. Well, I have great news for you because the general consensus is dead wrong. We're actually facing a wonderful future. Now, before I explain to you why we're facing this wonderful future, let me take you back to the late 1970s. For the late 1970s seemed to mark the end of Western civilization. We just suffered from two oil crises. We had stagflation with inflation and unemployment above 10% in most of Western Europe. We had dictatorships in Eastern Europe, in Southeast Asia, in Latin America, and even parts of, uh, of uh, Southern Europe. The Shah had fallen in Iran, the Soviet Union had invaded Afghanistan, the US had lost, it, lost Vietnam, and in 1973, the Club of Rome famously published the book, The Limits of Growth, announcing that we would run out of oil, gas, coal, and most natural resources within 40 years. No one predicted that in the next 40 years, we'd see democracies in Eastern Europe, Latin America, and Southern Europe, that unemployment and inflation would fall dramatically, that we'd see the greatest creation of wealth in the history of humanity as a billion people came out of poverty in the last 40 years alone. 650 million people came out of poverty in China alone, completely changing urban landscapes in the country as a whole. Despite 40 years of record consumption of oil and natural gas, we now have more reserves, known reserves, than we did then. And no one predicted the extent to which our lives have been completely transformed by new technologies like the internet, computers, and mobile phones. Now, if you take a step further back and you look on a 100-year scale, every few years there are recessions, every 30, 40 years, they're bigger crisis, they're like the Great Recession, the Great Depression. But as painful as they are to live in, on, on, on a long scale, uh, you, they're basically irrelevant in a period of unabated, continued economic growth. In fact, over the last 100 years, life expectancy has doubled from 40 to 80, GDP per capita has tripled, infant mortality is divided by 10. The cost of food, Transportation, communications has divided from a factor of 10 to 1,000. Global literacy has increased from 23% to 80%. To the point that we've redefined what poverty means. Today, 99% of Americans living in poverty have electricity, toilet. 95% of a television. 88% of a cell phone. 70% of a car and air conditioning. These are luxuries that were completely unimaginable 130 years ago to the wealthiest people in the world. We're also living in the most peaceful time in the history of humanity. So if you watch the news all the time and you see the Syrian conflict, you actually probably believe that violence is common. It's actually more rare than it's ever been in the history of humanity, not just in the last hundred years with the First World War and the Second World War, but as a percentage of the population, fewer people are dying in conflict than ever before. So we're truly living in extraordinary times. And the news I have to share with you today, which is the good news, is these times are continuing. When historians look back a hundred years from now, and they look at what were the most relevant facts of the last 10 years, they're not going to focus on the Euro crisis or the sovereign debt crisis or the Iraq and Afghanistan war. Instead, they'll focus on the extra extreme, extraordinary rise of Africa. Six of the fastest, 10 fastest growing economies in the world over the last 10 years have been African. 
So Graphica is rapidly being integrated in the global economy. In this times of austerity, people were talking about states doing less with less. But we have an extraordinary opportunity to do more with less. And countries like Estonia are showing us how the application of existing technologies can basically transform the areas of the economy that have not yet been touched by the technology revolution, especially education, healthcare, and public services, which account for over 50% of GDP in OECD countries. So in Estonia, to give you an example, 93% um, of people pay their taxes online. You can create a company online in a few minutes. 24% of the people or the population voted online in the last elections. School records are online, including homework, attendance, grades, etc. All the medical records are online. At the same time, pretty much all the all the all of our economies or all the different sectors or economies are currently being revolutionized. 3D printing is revolutionizing manufacturing. It's already revolutionized prototyping, and little by little, it's being integrated in manufacturing processes to make ready-made parts. 25% of the output of 3D printers are ready production-ready items. It also has the potential to revolutionize medicine, as the printing of a mini kidney has already proven. Within 10 years, 3D printing of organs based on our own, um, our, our own genetic makeup should actually alleviate the organ shortage and the rejection issues. Medicine as a whole is undergoing a, a revolution. Now, um, Watson, which is the IBM supercomputer that famously won Jeopardy, is already better at diagnosing certain types of cancers than doctors are. Now, that makes intuitive sense. A computer doesn't get bored, doesn't get tired. It has an eye for detail. It'll look at every millimeter of an MRI or an X-ray. Now, Watson costs $21 million more or less to develop and to build, but you need to remember that today's $21 million supercomputer is tomorrow's $100 cell phone. In fact, we're probably less than five years away from having a Star Trek-like functioning medical tricorder, a cell phone-sized device that will cost a couple hundred dollars that will do diagnosis better than most doctors. It will completely revolutionize medicine, especially in areas of Africa that don't have access to doctors. Robots have already invaded the factories, and they're starting to percolate in our in daily lives and are, going, and are set to really improve our lives. Now, DARPA built the Atlas robot. It's an extraordinary machine. It's six feet two, so it's about my height, 330 pounds, and it can be sent in disaster areas to save lives. The Da Vinci robot has already performed over 200,000 minimally invasive surgeries, and it's better at those than most human doctors. Within a few years, Amazon predicts that 80% of the deliveries will be done in, in less than 60 minutes by drones. And the reality is most of the rest will probably be done by self-driving vehicles of some sort. Google just announced last week that robotics are its next big project. And in fact, they bought seven robotic companies over the last few years. The Internet of Things is actually taking our everyday devices to the next level. Basically, all of a sudden, our coffee makers or vacuum cleaners are going to learn our habits and are going to serve us better, more cost efficiently. So to give you an example, the quirky made egg minder just tells you when eggs are going bad. It's very basic, but imagine if we could actually reduce human food waste by 50%. The most famous Internet of Thing object these days is the Nest thermostat. It actually, without any programmation on your end, learns your temperature settings, your preferences, your behavior, and creates the right environment for you de while decreasing your heating bills. And so the Internet of Things is actually not about things. The Internet of Things is about how do we improve our lives. Education is finally on the verge of a revolution. Imagine you took Socrates from 2,500 years ago, and you brought him today. There's very little of this world that he would recognize. But one of the few things he would recognize is the way we teach our kids. We teach our kids with a teacher of varying quality, spewing facts to students of varying quality. Arguably, that makes no sense. Now, some schools are starting to, to, to experiment with computerized teaching, where you're learning from the computer with curriculum exactly at your level 
in it with a gamified way in continuous testing. This way you can't be distracted, and you're learning exactly some material that suits you. And the teacher, instead of being this fact-spewing device, becomes a personal coach to these students. At the same time, education is becoming more scalable. Now, with Udacity and Coursera, you can have one professor, one really good professor, teach 300,000 students or, or, hundreds, or hundreds of thousands or even millions of students. And as such, education is changing from a one-time event that you graduate upon with your bachelor's degree or master's degree to a lifelong endeavor. And it's an amazing equality equalizer. All of a sudden, whether regardless of your age, regardless of your sex, regardless of your religion, regardless of where you live, you're going to have access to all these amazing courses and you can continue improving yourself with Khan Academy, Code Academy, etc. Transportation is also on the verge of a revolution. Every year in the US, $121 billion of economic activity is lost to congestion, both in wasted time and extra fuel charges. Every year, 1.2 million people die in 50 million accidents, creating untold human costs and economic costs. Originally, we thought that if we wanted to build self-driving cars, we would need to redo our highways. We would need intelligent highways. We'd need to redo the entire infrastructure. It would cost trillions of dollars. And that basically sounded far-fetched and impossible. But Google has shown us that's not the case. There are already self-driving cars in the Bay Area that have driven millions of miles with never an accident. Now, these devices today cost about $100,000, so they're not going to be on your car just next year. But with Moore's Law, in 18 months, that's $50,000. In 36 months, that's $25,000. It doesn't take very long for it not to be that expensive. And given that these devices or these self-driving cars don't have accidents, the insurance costs are going to be lower. And so you can imagine how they basically will be adopted the minute that it becomes cost-effective. In the meantime, the technology that allows for self-driving cars is being basically dumbed down and integrated in your existing cars. You already have cars with self-parking systems. You have cars that automatically brake when there's traffic in front of you. Elon Musk at Tesla announced that he wants to release a car within three years that can drive itself 90% of the way in most circumstances. Now, Elon has a tendency to be slightly overly optimistic, so it might be a bit more than three years, but it's actually very feasible to conceive that in 10 years, self-driving cars will be completely mainstream. Communications is being revolutionized. So it makes a lot of sense for Google to be working on Google Glasses because smartphones seem bound to disappear. We have made tremendous progress in brain reading. Uh, today, we have the ability to read images from someone's brain. If I put you in a somewhat unwieldy, mind you, fMRI scanner, um, you can project your thoughts onto a screen. You can actually fly a plane with your thoughts alone. Now, today, it takes a lot of practice, and it's extremely unwieldy. Again, you need these, this hat with 128 electrodes connected to a supercomputer. But this is going to change as Moore's Law makes it more cheaper and more miniaturized. So you can imagine a future where, with your thoughts, you're going to control, let's say, your glasses and tell them to write an email or send a message. Most likely, it actually won't have that little screen on the side that's really ugly. But maybe it'll, send, it'll, uh, it'll use lasers to project images on your retina and overlay the information for, um, onto your retinal field of vision, the way a projector would do it. And so imagine we're going to have augmented telepathy. I'm going to be able to think of a message to send to someone, and they're going to be able to receive it in their glasses and, and send it, to their, send it to, to their brain. Now, ultimately, we'll probably have brain-to-brain -brain communications, uh, the first instance of which happened August of 2013, and that's the image that you see on your right. These two gentlemen, now it's extremely basic today. You, it's not as though they're actually sharing meaningful thoughts, but it's step one. So it's a different time frame. You know, the first time frame, the, in the next 10 years, you're probably going to see the mind-reading uh, devices that allow you to control, let's say, your glasses or your smartwatch. Mind-to-mind -mind communications is probably 20, 30 years uh, in the future. But again, it's just the next step in the evolution of smartphones, basically. Now, energy is on the verge of a revolution. And it's one of the things that's making me the most optimistic about the future. Now, the idea that we're going to run out of energy is ludicrous. We're awash in it. 
Every 12 minutes, we receive enough energy from the sun to power our entire economy for an entire year. So as Peter Diamandis, who runs the XPRIZE Foundation, likes to say, the issue is not scarcity. The issue is accessibility. And it's an issue that we've actually faced as humans time and time again. So if you take you back to the, um, to, to the 1800s, aluminum was more expensive than gold. Now again, it kind of doesn't make sense that aluminum should be more expensive than gold. It's a very common element. It's the third most popular or common element in, in, Earth as, in the Earth's crust. Um, it, it's about 7% of the Earth's crust. Now, that said, it doesn't occur in natural form. And that's why it was so expensive. And so that's why the tip of the Washington Monument is in aluminum. Or when Napoleon III received the King of Siam, um, he gave to his guests silver utensils. He ate, he ate with, uh, with gold utensils, and he gave the King of Siam the aluminum utensils. A few years later, electrolysis was invented, dra rapidly dropping the cost of aluminum. Now, something similar is happening in solar. Solar has been improving in productivity by about 14% a year, every year, for the last 30 years. Um, to produce one watt of solar power costs $70 in 1977. It's down to 74 cents in 2013, and projected to continue decreasing. So at these rates, we're about a grid parity in remote places. We're about 10, 15 years from, remote, from grid parity and in sunny places of Western Europe and the US, and about 20 years from grid parity around the world. And when that happens, and so that's, let's say, 2035, tens of billions of dollars of investment will go naturally in it because it will be the cheapest form of power production. And that means that by 2050, with no government intervention, with no subsidies, with no regulation, we'll basically completely move away from a carbon-based economy to solar economy. And that's actually excluding amazing innovations that could happen in fusion or, frankly, even in solar. Now, what's interesting is when we reach that point, the marginal megawatt becomes basically free. And then we might be in a position to waste it the same way that you waste all these processing power in your cell phone. 40 years ago, computers are so expensive, we ration time. Today, they're so cheap, basically, we use them to throw angry birds at pigs. We throw them to check our Facebook status. When energy becomes basically free, you solve a whole host of other problems. So people have been saying, for instance, that we may face water wars and water shortages. But that doesn't make any sense. 70% of the Earth or of the Earth is covered by water. The issue is only 1.3% of it is accessible fresh water. But if you have unlimited free energy, you can actually desalinate the ocean and you have access to water. And that's actually excluding other innovations that may make it happen earlier. This is a device called the Slingshot. Um, which basically allows you to create 1,000 liters of fresh water from pretty much any source, be it uh, saline or polluted. At the same time, if you actually start solving your water problem, you solve your food problem. So the idea that we're going to run out of food also makes no sense. You can actually start growing crops in the desert. And that's actually excluding ideas that would allow us to improve ag agricultural productivity, like vertical farms. And so as humans, we're truly, truly blessed to be living in this amazing time. And as entrepreneurs and as investors, we're privileged to be actually making this world or this better world of tomorrow, a world of equality of opportunity and a world of plenty. Thank you.